Chapter 11 Static still crackled through Jacken's mind, blanking out even the lightest of sendings. But he could track the dragon by the trail of large puddles in the middle of the three tunnels leading away from the lake. Jacken searched his pockets frantically for a marker to leave for Aki. Finding none, he tore off a pocket instead and dropped it on the floor of the cave. It was the best he could do. The middle tunnel curved downward at a steep slope, but it too was lit with patches of phosphorescence. They were at such regular intervals, Jack and wondered if they had been placed there. Question number twelve, he thought grimly. The tunnel took one last abrupt turning, and then, suddenly, he could see light ahead. It wasn't the bright white light of outdoors, but rather a flickering reddish glow. For a moment he wondered if he should wait for Aki to catch up to him. He turned and looked over his shoulder, straining into the darkness behind, but he couldn't see her. In fact, he couldn't see anything. For a moment he listened, but his crackle-filled mind reached nothing. The only way to go was forward, so he edged slowly toward the red light. As he got closer, he heard a kind of steady growl above the mind crackling. It came from the same direction as the light. He moved forward again and began to distinguish two separate noises, one a low clanging and the other an echo. The closer he got, the more he became mesmerized by the light and sound. After so many hours in the cave, the color and noise both assaulted and drew him. Finally, overwhelmed by it all, he stopped, crouched down, and put his hands up over his ears. He squeezed his eyes tight until white sparks seemed to jump around in front of them. For a long time he squatted, unmoving. Then slowly his mind cleared, as if he were waking up and knew he was waking, but wasn't yet shed of a dream. He opened his eyes, took his hands away from his ears, and stood. His knees gave a protesting creak. The scene before him was as odd as anything he'd gotten from the dragon. It looked as if it were ascending he couldn't read properly. He was on the far end of a large cavern lit by flames from a central pit that was as wide across as the Nakara River. Sitting on a grillwork over the flames were large pots filled with something that glowed now red and now shadow. Above the pots, on an overhang of rock, were a half dozen leaning figures stirring the pots with long sticks. Were they men or not men? Arakul's puzzlement became his own. Men and not men. These creatures had a man's form, muscular and stockier than anyone Jacken had ever known. But there was something really wrong with the shape. They were much too broad in the shoulder, much too short in the leg. Men and not men. One of the strange, stocky creatures saw Jacken and pointed at him. Without a sound, the rest of them all looked up at once. Jacken felt his head suddenly filled with strings of picture questions. Like the sending of dragons, the questions were wordless and yet completely understandable. Who you? The thought came in sharp stabs of light. You, you, who you? It was not one mind, but a number of them asking the question. He could feel the differences as clearly as if they'd been individual voices. Jack and shouted at them across the pit, not yet trusting his mind, needing to feel the precision of words in his mouth. Aki was right about that. I am Jacken, Jacken Stewart, from Sarkhan's nursery, bondsman and trainer, master now. He felt no need to disguise who he was. Surely these creatures knew nothing about the rogue pit. Unaccountably, his hand went to his chest, his fingers fumbling for the bond bag that had hung there for so many years. Then he gave a short, staccato laugh. None of that seemed to mean anything to them. He'd try another tack. I am Jack and Stewart of the mountains, out of heart's blood. Who are you? That seemed to reach them. They put down their sticks and looked at one another, gesturing wildly but still not speaking aloud. Then, as if on a signal, they all turned and faced him, staring. Their eyes, even from so far away, seemed to glow like an animal's in the dark. Jacken felt his mind fill up again until he felt it would overflow, for the sending was so loud and overpowering, he couldn't move. It was like Aki's first sendings multiplied a hundredfold. Hot points of sizzling lights danced in his brain. How long he stood there, stupefied, he couldn't have said, but suddenly he felt a painful slap on his cheek and he could see and move again. His mind cleared. In front of him stood the man who had delivered the blow, arms still upraised. A man, definitely. Stocky, broad-shouldered, hulking, but unquestionably a man. He was stripped down to a skin loincloth, his feet in leather sandals, his chest hairy, his head smooth, but a man. Despite the singing cheek, Jack had smiled at him. The man was a full head shorter than he was. I told you who I was, Jack had said. Who are you? The man raised his hand again. This time Jacken saw the blow as well as felt it, yet he couldn't move from it or respond in kind, for at the same time a ringing admonition leaped into his mind. 
Do not cry ya, youngling. You not child. Still you give child cry ya. Be man. Bewildered, Jackin felt himself cast loose of the second mind spell. He put his hand to his cheek. He could still feel the heat of the blow beneath his fingers. I Mac. The sending was short, brutal, final. But whether that was his name, his title, or some other designation was not clear. Before Jackin could respond, Mac grabbed his arm and jerked him forward until his feet were curled over the lip of the rock. For a moment, Jackin was afraid Mac meant to push him over into the flames. For a short man, he was very powerful. As another protest started to form on his lips, Jackin felt instructions insinuate themselves in his head. He glanced down at his feet. Below, where his toes curled over the rim, was a rough carved set of steps. Down! He had no choice. With Mac at his back, Jackin carefully made his way down the stone steps, hugging the rock as he went. He could hear the whisper of the man's feet behind him as he descended, and his head seemed filled with an alien presence he couldn't quite shake loose. The only thing he could do, and he did it with deliberate care, was to keep Aki's face out of his thoughts. She must not be caught, as he was, by the not-man men.